What have I done in this country? Um, we, we. That I must be pursued the way I've been pursued. The winds of change are blowing in the ruling party, in the government, and in the country. They believe they could use technicalities in parliament. We represent the majority in the public. They indicated one thing and one thing only, that they're a guarantor for our, for our democracy. They understand it better, in fact, than people who are serving in the state organs. I, I think he needs, he needs to be a president. Those who said he must step down, no. Mm -mm. To us, he's an innocent man. He's a champion for economic transformation of this country. President Zuma represents the majority of the people of this country who remain in poverty, whom we believe. A good time, perhaps, to look back at the legacy, good and bad, of Jacob Zuma as the ANC president and as the president of South Africa. Many have called him South Africa's most colorful and controversial president, but Jacob Zuma is much beyond just that. He was born into poverty, went into exile to fight apartheid, before rising to become the people's president. Zuma swept to power on the 9th of May 2009, largely due to his charisma. His popular touch was in stark contrast to Tabombeki's aloofness. Just about 11 years ago, he had defeated Tabombeki as the head of the ANC at the highly contested Polokwane conference. During that time, the mantra was, uh, you need to try the tested leaders. And uh, you needed somebody who uh, met those standards. And the standards m meant in the ANC that you either had been to jail or you had been to exile and you'd been an, an activist. And Mbeji was a formidable character. And then the, the ANC delegates realized that there's only one person who meets all that criteria of uh, tried and tested. And he had one advantage, he had been to jail, but he had not been to exile and he was also head of intelligence, and he had worked with people like uh, O.R. Tambo. So he himself could match Mbeki. And at the time, Mbeki also had uh, risen to a stage where he was very aloof. Zuma's tryst with controversies is not new. In June 2005, it was Mbeki who fired Zuma as deputy president, citing allegations of corruption related to his financial advisor, Shabir Sheikh. But like the proverbial phoenix that rises from the ashes, Zuma defeated Mbeki to become the ANC president just about two years later. And Mbeki realized that this is a man who I brought in not to make him the next president. And uh, then he used the pretext of a case where uh, Zuma was mentioned unfavorably. Then he decided to fire him. For most people, they realized that he was actually using and abusing state institutions and abusing his power to remove a person that he was uncomfortable with. So that led to the groundswell that later was called by people like Vavi a tsunami. So the firing, he came out as somebody who has been victimized for being who he is. So that uh, firing backfired. Zuma, 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 Zuma. Zuma rode to power based on strong support from the grassroots, trade unions and the communists. His Zulu antecedents and colorful demeanor endeared him to the masses. Zuma himself ensured that the carefully crafted image remained intact. He even left no opportunity to capitalize on his history as a guerrilla fighter. His anthem, at one point, translated, Bring Me My Machine Gun, portrayed him as a man of action to his supporters. 
Here's a look at Zuma's legacy as a fighter. He was a member of the Umkonto Wesizwe ANC's military arm. Convicted of conspiring to overthrow South Africa's government, he spent 10 years in prison on Robben Island. Lived in exile for 15 years in several African countries. Re-established ANC's underground structures in the then Natal between 1974 and 1975. He headed the ANC intelligence department when it was battling infiltration. Zuma, on the other hand, was seen as a man of the people. He was able to relate with the unions, was able to relate with people who were in the rural areas, he was able to relate with traditional leaders. So he was able to craft that image of a man of the people, and which he has actually remained, because nobody can accuse Jacob Zuma of uh, having been a president who was aloof. Even when he goes to rural areas, he, he, he is able to find comfort with ordinary people. By the time his second term as president came about, Zuma was battling a slew of allegations, primary among them security upgrades at his Nganla homestead. But controversies and scandals never stopped Zuma's ride to glory. He was elected for a second term as president in 2014, despite the challenge of anti-incumbency and the Nganla affair. The last one year has been conspicuous by the growing calls for Zuma's exit, both from within and outside the party. State capture allegations, the 783 corruption charges and the controversy surrounding Zuma have all but overshadowed some solid achievements of his administration. The advances made by ANC government are hidden behind the negative and personalized commentary that dominates the discourse. I think that there are numerous achievements, and I think at the top of, of mind is um, his uh, free education uh, proclamation, as well as his uh, celebration of women leadership within the ANC. And he's the one leader who has effected ANC policies on women advancement, far more so than his predecessors. And I think what he's done, uh, even if he leaves before his term, which I don't think is going to happen, he leaves behind a legacy of uh, RET uh, with, with, with strong momentum on land uh, expropriation without compensation, on free education, on uh, the nationalization of key, um, key uh, resources uh, within, within the financial sector. So whether he leaves or not, I think we have a very strong mark of uh, President Zuma within the ANC moving forward. And it's based on policy effective policies of fast tracking of RET policies and I think that is a very big gift to the new president of, of, of the country because he has set a very useful and very strong foundation for RET moving forward. Here's a brief look at Zuma's legacy as the president of South Africa. Successful life-saving extension of HIV AIDS medication and treatment launched HIV counseling and testing campaign in 2010, announced free higher education for poor and working class students, expanded the school feeding scheme to benefit millions of children, signed a record number of SIU proclamations to interrogate corruption, ensured state procurement spend helps small black businesses, constituted National Planning Commission to develop a long-term strategic vision for South Africa repositioned South Africa geopolitically by aligning with BRICS. Ask Jacob Zuma what he would want to be remembered for most during his tenure as state president, and he says that he cannot choose for the people. In an interview with ANN7 in November 2017, much before he gave up the mantle of ANC president, here's what he said in response to that question. There was this fellow who came from Ganja, <coughs> in the rural areas, uh, joined the struggle at a young age, uh, went all out, ready to die. Um, <coughs> and, 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 and with time developing the, in, 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 the, in the ANC through the ranks, 
and finally reached the level of uh, leadership. Uh, and when he was <coughs> uh, part of the leadership, there are quite a number of things that uh, <coughs> uh, 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 happened that he was involved in. People will remember whatever. I can't choose for them. Among one of the remarkable achievements of the ANC government under Zuma is the National Development Plan, a long-term plan for South Africa's development with a vision for social reconstruction. I did everything I could within my power and capacity to help implement the policies of the ANC to bring about a lot of things that I thought were near we needed it to be brought. <clears throat> I introduced new departments, uh, <clears throat> quite a number of them. Uh, we have been talking about rural development, <clears throat> and I thought talking about it, not doing anything about it, was not helping. It was important to focus, and therefore I established a department. But I also <clears throat> uh, uh, implemented what had always been my view, that as a country we need a plan that is overarching of the country and, and, and worked for the National <coughs> Development Plan uh, and succeeded to have it the manner in which we have so that the country, whatever all of us, whatever we do, we know where we are going, what is our objectives. Not that the NDP, like most government-led programs, has not been criticized, Many have called it a vision without a concrete plan. But others praise the blueprint that it provides for South Africa's Vision 2030. What he did in his first term as the ANC leader, he successfully managed to bring back life into the NDP. And thanks to the involvement then of COSATU as well as the SACP uh, being the forces that pushed that to happen. And we saw the health system, the health policies, and the delivery of basic needs in the country like water, sanitation, as well as electricity, which are programs of the NDP. They were taken care of. And, and I think the Zuma administration has done very well in rolling out what was planned within the National Development Plan. More recently, the ANC's call for radical economic transformation under Zuma's leadership has been hailed as the panacea for apartheid era injustices. The call to integrate black majority in the economic mainstream has seen many rally behind Zuma. Proposals such as land expropriation without compensation and free higher education, among others, were adopted as ANC policy under his leadership. He leaves behind a legacy of uh, RET uh, with, with, with strong momentum on land uh, expropriation without compensation, on free education, on uh, the nationalization of key, um, key uh, resources uh, within, within the financial sector. So whether he leaves or not, I think we have a very strong mark of uh, President Zuma within the ANC moving forward. And it's based on policy effective policies, of fast tracking of RET policies. And I think that is a very big gift to the new president of, of, of the country because he has set a very useful and very strong foundation for RET moving forward. It's an issue of radical economic transformation. And when he talked about it, he says, let's look at the patterns of ownership. Let's look at the patterns of control of the economy. Let's look at the management. He says it cannot be right that 23 years later, the household family, white household, earns more income, is five times that of a black household. And he looked at the expenditure of government, and he found that government resources go largely to white companies. And he says from now on, every major project in government, 30% of it must go to black hands so that we begin to de-racialize the economy. So you're talking about somebody with a plan. And yet, if you go back to the previous people who had the benefit of education, what you found is that they didn't even have these plans. But the challenge that the, with Zuma has has been more personal than policy. 
However, in his November 2017 interview with ANN7, Zuma firmly placed the credit for the party's radical socio-economic transformation call with the movement. For me, talking about radical socio-economic transformation, it's not that I'm talking about my thing. I'm talking about the policy of the ANC. In other words, sharpening the implementation of the policies of the ANC. Not that this is, I want this to be my legacy. It's a legacy of the ANC. I think what would be important is that perhaps at a given time, the ANC decided to say we need radical socio-economic transformation as the ANC. We as KDAS, once the resolution is taken, we've got to implement it. And if I'm the president, I've got to lead to that. That is why when we went to Mangao, we had to crystallize this. And of course, for some time, people did not necessarily uh, highlight it that much. And at a particular time, I thought it was important as a leader to clarify this as much as possible. That is why I even tried to define it so that people must know what is it that we are talking about. Members of the ANC must be clear what is it that we are talking about, what is it that we want to do. But the country as well must be clear that this is not a, a weird policy. It's a policy to correct the past. So it is absolutely crucial. And, and, and the ANC must follow this policy. Because if you don't, you are going to stay in poverty, in inequality for a long time. Zuma's announcement of free higher education ahead of the December conference took many in the ANC by surprise. Many called the timing of the announcement suspect, but perhaps Zuma had recognized the writing on the wall. Perhaps, unsure of his successor, Zuma delivered on the promise that he had made to South African youth. It is a masterstroke because Zuma will go into retirement as a former president, having made sure that he has delivered free tertiary education to the needy students and needy families of this country who have been excluded from tertiary education because they cannot raise the money to pay for the fees. So that declaration already gives Zuma immortality. It gives Zuma access into the, 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 the legendary book of records. His legacy will go down as a legacy that will always idolize him as a person who made sure that he delivered uh, free basic education and free tertiary education to the needed students of South Africa. Another less hailed but crucial legacy of Zuma's administration remains the alignment of South Africa with the BRICS community. The inclusion in the group of the fastest growing economies in the world has opened many more doors for South Africa than ever before. What uh, the BRICS um, alignment does, it gives also South Africa another opportunity. First, it's about the, the markets. We no longer have to rely only on the West, whether it's uh, with the West as uh, places where we export our material, but the, what it opens is also people who may want to invest in South Africa. So we, we are actually saying we're open for business, whether it comes from the West, whether it comes from the East. And the, President Zuma was very clear about that. He was saying we are not replacing one with the other, but what we're doing, we're saying the various groupings and alignments that we have must complement them, uh, each other so that uh, we advance South Africa. So for him, the primary issue is South Africa's economic and social development. But as stated earlier, Zuma's achievements as a leader of the state and the ruling party have been completely overshadowed amidst a flood of controversies and allegations surrounding him. It started with Ngandla, where the public protector's findings, followed by the court ruling, totally cornered Zuma. The opposition accused him of flouting the constitution and benefiting from the security upgrades at his residence. Zuma, however, maintains that he did nothing wrong, calling the Bruhaha politically motivated. When uh, the story about Nganda started, 
Zuma has chowed so many millions. There were three investigations. Every, they found nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, <clears throat> finally, I think it was the public protector who said, well, um, because of certain items, Zuma and his family indirectly benefited. Not that Zuma stole money, but up to now, up to today, people think that Zuma, if you talk about corruption, is Gala. But there's nothing, there's nothing factual. It's just political. Uh, then <clears throat> the public protector says, uh, maybe he must pay something about this indirect benefit. She doesn't say how much Zuma must pay. She then says, two ministers, the police and finance will have to determine. <clears throat> and I wait for the determination. I wait for a long time. But I'm being punished that I did not pay. I was now being funny to my oath. <laughs> A slew of court rulings in the recent past only served to further unsettle the Zuma presidency. The Nkandla ruling, reinstatement of the 783 charges, followed by Zuma losing successive court bids to fight Maronsela's state capture report, saw the opposition close ranks. The result? A slew of no-confidence motions against him, which he successfully warded off. Uh, it was an unfortunate situation in which I think the president handled well at the end by responding to the decisions of the court, by complying with the decision of the court and paying back the money that was due or that he, according to the court records and, 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 and conclusions, that he unduly benefited for. So he paid back that money and I think it was the right decision to be made, although a lot of damage was made not only by him as the leader of the ANC, but as well as the cabinet ministers who were involved in that whole process of renovating Nkandla, spending public monies on Nkandla, and actually even lying to the public about what had to be done and or what was done. In I've written before in, in some of my columns that uh, even if he was to save a drowning child from a, from a rapid, he would still be described as a villain. And I think there's been this villainization of President Zuma. And we need to actually understand what's behind that because it's not so much about President Zuma. It is about a black leader who will stand for his people. And white people don't like that. And... Um, so I think they've villainized him and they've superheroed some more, more um, compatible uh, uh, black people to stand for them. And that's, that's a shame because I think this, this villainization of President Zuma is actually a villainization of black leaders and thereby a villainization of black people. The noise over the state capture allegations in particular made Zuma's position untenable. The allegations, although unproven, not only saw the opposition up the ante, but also deeply divided the ruling party. The fact that the allegations in Madoncella's own words still need to be tested did not do much to curb the high decibel campaign against Zuma. State capture actually became the final nail, uh, the straw that broke the camel, because when you look at how it was handled from the beginning, uh, Zuma, President Zuma at one point thought he had it under control. As they continue to be peddled, the, the, the allegation in the media, various forms of the media, and actually as the, these issues peeled into the international community, it became too huge an issue for, for President Zuma to ignore. We don't have any court position on state capture. We don't have a case running in the courts of South Africa regarding the state capture. It happened, or it, the, the, the narrative of state capture, or the state of capture, happened under the Zuma administration. But I think it will go down well in the history books that him allowing and implementing what the public protector's office recommended, what the court has ruled on in having a commission of inquiry into the state of capture in South Africa. It will go down well in the history books. But what pleases me well is that President Zuba planned his mind very well to this, to this recommendation and extended the issue of the state of capture. Many even calling Jacob Zuma's legacy the worst for the party and the country. Some even calling it a legacy of failures. Well, I think he reversed the mess that was created by Mbeki 
on education, on HIV AIDS, and on failure to invest in economic infrastructure. I think he's more likely to be remembered as a, uh, as a not, certainly not as an enemy of the people, but as a president of the people. He has strengthened the democracy, which means people have debated. His cases have been before the courts. Um, we saw the parliament, how they openly debate, uh, how he, he sits there waiting for his turn, even after so many interruptions. We have seen each case being interrogated in courts of law. So in a way, he has strengthened, he has set a different precedent, whether it's by default or by making, but he has set a different precedent of how you look at at a president. In his own words, though, Jacob Zuma believes that he did the best that he could, and now it is for history to judge him. I have put my effort wherever I thought it was necessary. There could, of course, therefore be some individuals that were more outstanding, like uh, <clears throat> President Tambo. Uh, President Mandela, which is fine, these were great leaders. Many of us who were uh, cadres just contributed, following our leaders, contributing to strengthen the ANC, unite the ANC, but also to ensure that we do things that must change South Africa for the better. Oh, what is so sangana the freedom day kubalande liboke what is so sangana the freedom day thank you very much realebuka